Good night, everyone, and welcome once again to another RIA 2020 Revolution in Agriculture series. Tonight, we would be focusing on burger party making, and the presenter has already promised us that at the end of this presentation, we will all be hungry, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, it, it, is, it is a pleasure to, um, to be part of this session tonight. You know our objective is to grow healthy minds, food, and businesses. So what we want to do tonight is give you some information to grow the mind. So hopefully you can take this information and move forward to grow a successful business. So without any further delay, I will hand over to you, Mr. Riyad, sir. No problem. All right, so let me just stop sharing the screen. All right, everybody can see the screen there. Um, good evening, everyone. Tonight we'll be focusing on burger patty making. This is a strong and amazing collaboration between homegrown business solutions and tropical agriculture consultancy services. My name is Riyad Mohammed. So tonight we'll cover in this one of our presentation, uh, the history of burger making, some good agricultural and manufacturing practices that are associated with the burger making, the burger party making process, the types of burger parties, the burger party making ingredients, the recipes, we'll actually go through about four brief recipes. Um, most importantly in this type of um, lecture, this is not a raw material production lecture. So we have to focus a bit more on, on the health side of stuff where we'll go through the hazard analysis and critical control points protocols, as well as discuss some biosecurity measures of getting into the food business. Our vision at Tropical Agriculture is to be the leading agribusiness development and consultancy company promoting sustainable agribusinesses and to improve the livelihoods of all communities. So before we get into the, the meat of the presentation, um, let's just go through some brief agricult good agricultural practices. So what are they? They are a set of rules and principles, all right? It's sustainably producing food of a high and nutritious quality consistently. Now that's a good agricultural practice. There's also good manufacturing practices. What are they? They are a set of principles, regulations, and technical recommendations applicable to production, processing, and food transport addressing human health care environment protection and improvement of worker conditions and their families. So all of these are associated with good agricultural practices. What is PPE? I'm sure you have heard the term before. It's personal protective equipment. So in the agricultural field, using PPE is not only highly recommended, but it is mandatory by the body named OSHA or Occupational Safety and Health administration. And the real reason we want to use the PPE on agricultural operations is to reduce the risk that may be harmful to health in both the short and the long term. Personal protective equipment. So what areas do they cover? The PPE generally covers the eyes and face, hearing, respiratory, hand, head, foot, and even clothing. So let's get right into the presentation now. History of burger party making. So burger parties became very, very famous 
around the 1960s, right? So mm -hmm. after the Coca-Cola revolution, the hamburger has been known to be the best American invention globally. Now, the, the name hamburger, it does not mean that that burger or that patty is made of ham, but mainly of ground beef. That's a traditional hamburger. So by the Code of Federal Regulations 2015, a hamburger is subsequently defined as consistent of chopped fresh and or frozen beef with or without the addition of beef fat as such and or seasoning shall not contain more than 30% fat, which is one key performance indicator we'll be focusing on, and shall not contain added water, phosphates, binders, or extenders. Now, for those of you who would have been in the sausage making presentation, you would realize now that burgers and sausages are two different sides of the same coin, where both of them, they start off with a nice protein base such as meat. But the sausage making, they would have added offals. In burger making, burger party making, we only use meat. All right, and all of these are targets. So in the sausage making or the sausage making class, we would have added water, phosphates, binders, and even extenders, such as wheat. All right, but in the, in the burger party making, we are not using any of those. And we have a threshold fat standard to be included of no more than 30%. So the burger party fits very, very well into our busy lifestyles. So it's good for appetizing and entertaining. It's quick, easy and affordable meals for kids and it's safe to consume, all right? There are some added effects of salting, pH, curing and drying and cooking. Now, I want you all to think about some questions before we go into deeper into the presentation. The first question is, how much nutrients does it take to grow healthy forages to feed livestock? That's the first question. The second question is, how much forage is required to obtain good growth and meat quality characteristics in cattle? All right, so we just want to use cattle as for this example. How much meat is obtained per animal post slaughter? Now, how much does that whole process cost? How much does it take to make one beef burger? So these are, these are just some questions I'd like you to think about as we go through the, the presentation tonight. So why consume burger patties? So why is it an excellent choice? It, has a, it holds excellent flavor. It's a very high quality of protein, even higher than that of sausage. It has all the essential amino acids. It promotes growth, maintenance, and repair of body tissues very well. And it's actually packed with vitamins and minerals. Before, like I say, we get deeper into the burger party making, we must understand what are the factors of livestock production because livestock and livestock products feed directly into the burger party making process. So what are the factors of livestock production? Nutrition and feeding, breeding and reproduction, housing and environment, health and disease, socioeconomic considerations, animal behavior and welfare. Now, why did I introduce to you the factors of livestock production? If we can manage all of these six factors perfectly or very well, we'll have animals growing comfortably and very fast in a nice, safe and healthy environment. Now, when you have livestock growing in that positive environment, what type of end product do you think you'll get after slaughter? It will also be positive products. So as we get into the patty making process, patties are usually made mainly with or from beef. All right, so you have to understand the nutritional values of each of the type of meats you want to use to make your patties. So this here is a figure of the beef nutritional values. Here you would see the nutritional values of chevron or goat meat. 
And you would realize in, in this table that the fat percentage of goat is very low. The nutritional values of lamb. And for those who don't know, lamb is meat from sheep under one year old and mutton is meat from sheep that is over one year old. So there's a clear distinction between lamb and mutton. In the presentation, we'll also come across something called carcass fabrication. I shall give you the definition for carcass fabrication very soon. Just take a look at the diagrams. So let's define what butchering is first. Butchering is a process of slaughtering and processing meat for retail and wholesale use. Very simple definition. What is dressing percentage? It's the warm carcass weight divided by the fasted live weight multiplied by 100. What does this mean? If we want to calculate the dressing percentage for a 10 pound live weight chicken, after slaughter, that animal would have weighed approximately seven pounds. So that's seven pounds of warm carcass. So seven pounds over 10 pounds multiplied by 100 means that the dressing per percentage for that chicken is 70%. All right, and it's where the head, the feet, offals, well, in this case, we have feathers and other parts are removed. All right, so that is not counted. And what is carcass fabrication? It's the process of cutting, boning, and portioning large cuts of meat to menu specifications. And it's usually fabricated by the primal cuts and subprimal cuts. This is, of course, we'll go further into in 2021. All right, so look how many parts you could get from any basic cattle. You have your strip, skirt, flank, ribeye, sirloin. All of these are different fabricated parts. And each of them holds a different price. And each of them could be used in a different type of cuisine. So what type of meats could we use in the burger party making process? We have to become very creative because traditionally, when we say burger party, most people think that it's beef alone we are using. But now we have chefs that make burger parties out of veal, chevron, lamb, mutton, poultry, even seafood, and even wild game. All right, so how do you class or what types of burger patties are there? Now, many chefs have classed burger, burger patties on several criteria. Usually some name them or class them by if they are handcrafted or the shape, the, if, if they are machine made, if there's a specific combination of mixed meats, of mixed flavors, even branded by country or by region. So down to the burger patty making process. What we want to start with is high quality meat with no less than 20% fat. So our borders should be between 20 to 30% fat. All right, so the chuck in the cattle is most used. Um, secondary to the chuck is the brisket and short ribs. So the photograph on, the, on your left is beef chuck, and you can see how well marbled it is. So it's a bit juicy when cooked. Now, if you go to the supermarket, and you buy the lean market mixes. The lean market mixes are generally 90% meat and 10% fat. 
Now, if you start to use a burger or make a burger with that ratio, what you will have is a very dry fatty after the cooking process because it does not have enough fat. All right, what we want to look for is the 80-20 ratio, right? 80% meat, 20% fat. And the fat increases the juiciness within the patty itself. So let's go through some cooking measurements before we go deeper into the presentation. Three teaspoons is equal to one tablespoon. Two tablespoons is equal to one ounce. Four tablespoons is equal to one quarter cup. One cup is equal to eight fluid ounces. Two cups is equal to one pint. Two pints is equal to one quart. Four quarts is equal to one gallon. So the burger patty making process is actually much simpler than the sausage making process. And the burger patties hold a much higher price. All right, so the general processes are weighing and measuring the ingredients, chopping or grinding, and just cooking. Very, very, very simple. So what we want is to have a, a meat sauce with more than 20% fat, all right? But not too much more than 20%. If you go over the 30% mark, what is really happening is that it will be too much fat in that burger patty mix. And when cooked, the patty will actually fall apart. So you want to stay within the range between 20% and 30%. And what you want to achieve, unlike the sausage making, is for the burger patties, you want a coarse grind. All right, and it's required to come, right, as compared to the sausage making, you want it coarse. Right, so you are generally have two different types of burger patties, the diner style and the tavern style. So let's go through the diner style first. This is what is most commonly served. All right, it's cooked on a flat surface like a cast iron pot, not a grill. All right, and each patty, weighs around four ounces. That's in the uncooked phase or stage. So let's start off with using 32 ounces of beef and that will create eight patties, eight four ounce patties. What you want to do is to form those four ounce meat chunks into orbs or balls, all right? And then place it into your hot cast iron pot. It should be around 70 degrees Celsius. What we really want to do during this process is cook the patty straight through, all right, the entire thickness. So what we want to do after you have the pot is to add oil or butter to the hot pan. You want to place the orbs on the hot surface and use, using a stiff, spatula, you want to press each orb down to form a tin patty. All right, so to look a little rugged at the sides as you can see here. Each patty should be around four inches in diameter and about half inch thick. Now this is the diner style patties. And after 90 seconds on one side at the right heat, the patty should be turned. When you turn, you'll observe a brownish crust. After the 90 seconds on the other side, what you want to do is remove the patty and allow it to rest for one to two minutes. All right, and that's the diner style patties. Now we move on to the tavern style hamburger patties. Now these are large, plump and juicy patties, as you can see in the photo here. So they are thick, they are juicy, they have a medium char and they are done medium to rare in terms of meat cooked. So we are using the same cast iron pot. 
it's preferred or via grill. No, the difference between this party and the diner style parties is that each party should be between six to eight ounces, preferably eight ounces of meat. Now, if it's too large, if it's over eight ounces, it will be too large and difficult to cook. If it's too thin or too small or less than six ounces, it will just be classed as a diner party. What we want to do is start with the same two pounds or 32 ounces of beef. All right, but this will only yield four tavern style patties. And what we want to do is to handcraft these patties, right? So use our hands to make a generally round shape. So the patty size itself on the, on, on the uncooked side, it should be around 3.5 inches in diameter, which is a bit smaller than the diner style in terms of diameter size. And what you want to actually have is it to be one inch in thickness. If it's not one inch, it cannot be classed as a tavern style patty. All right, what you also want to do in the that packing process is not to pack the meat too tightly and you just want to allow tiny air pockets. Look at the photo on the top and the bottom and tell me what you observe as a difference. You'll observe a gentle sink in the middle of the second photo or the photo on the lower side of the page. I'll, I'll explain why is that in a few minutes. So after you season your meats and you, you basically see, season with salt and pepper, that's the traditional way of doing your burger patties. And then after you form the patty, you season once more lightly, right? So you reapply the season externally. Then you add the oil or butter to the large pan and place over the medium heat. Now, seeing that this patty is much thicker, it will take a longer time to cook. Now, if you could see in this photograph here, the chef is actually pressing down on one side of the burger patty. Why? He's actually making a small indent in the patty so it could be cooked easily or easier. So you want to gently place on a hot surface and allow one side to cook for three minutes and it should not be disturbed. It must hold form for three minutes of continuous cooking. You want to spread your patties far apart and then switch or flip to the other side. And then cook for another three minutes. After this period, you want to remove and rest for about five minutes before serving. That's actually where the flavors come together and the party itself gets to cool straight down to the core. It takes around five minutes. So ingredient selection. Let's begin with the end in mind. What's the difference between sausage making and burger party making? We only use high quality meat for the burger party making. We are not using offals at all. We want well marbled meat for binding between 20 to 30% fat. <clears throat> we also want the meat to be very clean. No contamination of harmful microbes. Hence storage and salt, Addition, additional salt is very important in that process. We can now add our seasonings and spices and new local combinations. Also add our sodium nitrate or even basic salt will work. Now there are many different ways to flavor the patties. All right, these are some of the seasonings you could use, such as bay leaf, even basil, cumin, caraway, black pepper, cardamom, chicory, celery seeds, chili peppers, size, celery, cilantro, cloves, coriander, all grown locally, cumin, fennel, ginger, lavender, basil, lemongrass, 
Miss, not Meg. Oregano, rosemary, peppermint. Even sage, sorrel, spearmint. Tarragon, thyme, mustard, so you could see that there, there's no limit to how much seasonings or the combinations of seasonings you could specially craft your patty into that, that ideal flavor. Now, as it comes to salt, there are generally four types of salt you could use. There is the rock salt which is generally produced from dried underground seabeds. There is table salt, right? It's refined and fortified with iodine and contains anti-caking compounds. It also has kosher salt. It's an unfortified rock salt without anti-caking ingredients and can also be used in cooking. And then there is sea salt, which is very potent and obtained from the evaporated seawater. It's really salty. Sodium nitrate could also be used, but to a much lesser extent. It's more used in the commercial scale of operations. Why is it used? It's used to inhibit the production and growth of clostridium and other microbacteria and flora. It also adds the color characteristics and improves the flavor. Some of the burger patty making equipment. Uh, a basic kitchen scale, a meat grinder, meat thermometer, liquid smoke, or depends on the flavor you want to achieve. You could actually have a smoker as well. Your refrigerator, your cast iron pot, bowl chopper, and your patty molder. This is a photograph of the patty making equipment. So this is a patty forming machine. This could make up, up to 2,100 patties an hour and it's food grade materials that's used to, to build such machinery. See how small and efficient it looks? All right, so such equipment could also function as it could do mixing, forming, battering, flooring, frying, steaming, instant freezing, and even packaging. So there's so much technology and equipment now to, to facilitate even small homes, home scale and homegrown operations as you gradually go into the commercial size operations or semi-commercial. Now, what's very interesting about the burger party making process is that we could we could make non-traditional burger patties. The, the traditional burger patty was made mainly of beef. Now we could change how things are done. We could use it in, we could use poultry uh, as a raw material start, seafood, vegetables, goat meat, sheep meat, and even wild game. This right here is how a seafood patty looks. So in terms of the poultry patties, some good starter bases are chicken, turkey, and even duck. I would prefer to use duck because of the extra fat in the duck meat itself. And what you want to add for extra juiciness after you have created that patty is ketchup, onions, mayo, mustard, right? To also enhance the flavor profile. As we move on to seafood patties, we use um, seafood that's higher in fat. Generally speaking, the tuna and salmon, all right? Shrimp could also be used, all right? And in the seafood patties, we want to also use like breadcrumbs or eggs as the binding agents. So there are four small recipes we will go through. Um, recipe one is the basic burger patty. These are the list of ingredients. One and a half pounds of ground beef, all right, so like we said, 80% lean meat and 20% fat. About one egg, three quarter teaspoon salt, 
three quarter teaspoon freshly ground black pepper, three quarter cup of seasoned breadcrumbs, and one tablespoon of any flavor type of sauce you'd like to add. That's a basic recipe for a traditional burger patty. Recipe two, using two pounds of ground beef, one egg beaten, three quarter cup of dry breadcrumbs, three tablespoons of evaporated milk. All right, so you could get some extra flavor, moisture, and fat from evaporated milk. Two tablespoons of any type of sauce you want to add. One eighth a tablespoon of cayenne pepper or any pepper locally grown. Two cloves of garlic, finely minced and crushed. Add it to your mix. This is a, another recipe or a variation. Recipe three. Using one and a half pounds of beef, preferably the chuck because you see how well marbled the chuck is. A tablespoon of what, whichever sauce or flavoring you want to use. One and a half teaspoons of seasoned salt. You could even create your own seasoned salt by dehydrating different seasonings. One teaspoon of garlic powder, half teaspoon of ground black pepper. Optionally, you could add four slices of cheese, four hamburger buns, all right? And hamburger toppings such as lettuce, tomatoes, onions, pickles, ketchup, mustard, and mayo. So we have to become very creative using different seasonings and even different meat combinations to achieve the different varieties or levels of patties. And look at recipe four. We are not using beef in, in, the, in this recipe. Using actually 250 grams of minced chicken, coriander leaves, green chilies, one teaspoon of salt, three bread slices, half a teaspoon agar masala, a small onion, two tablespoons of bizan, one egg beat, four tablespoons of breadcrumbs, one teaspoon of ginger paste, one teaspoon of garlic paste, one teaspoon of lemon juice, and three tablespoons of oil to get that fat and juice in there. All right, so this is how we'll have to add if we are using the non-traditional beef patty mixes. So what I'd like for you all to also think about is how could we, how much of a Trinidad and Tobago hamburger could we make? How much percent of it could we make local? So I was thinking about using the coconut based bun, using goat cheese as the cheese in the burger, using our fresh lettuce such as your romaine lettuce or panis lettuce, using fresh tomatoes such as your cherry tomatoes, or even beef steak tomatoes, a, a nice juicy type, even our fresh um, pineapples from the table and area. And, a and now you will have a handcrafted mixed meat patty. At the end, you all could assume or, or, or tell me how much of this is, a is, is local. If it's 100%, 90%, 80, or, or which, how much of it you really think it's local? Look at the ingredients again. So getting into the good manufacturing practices, we have to go through things like the food safety guidelines. So some basic safety tips while doing operations like these are washing of hands for 20 seconds with soap and water between procedures. Use clean equipment from the start. You want to sanitize your work surfaces with chlorine bleach solution, one tablespoon per gallon and allow to air dry. You want to keep all the raw meats separate from all the other foods and ingredients. We are not going to keep the meat out of the fridge or refrigerator unless we are going to deal with it or start operations. So what we want to do is keep that meat at four degrees Celsius at all times. And what we also want to try to achieve is to cook that meat at a low temperature consistently and constantly. 
these are some pathogens that you may encounter in the burger patty making process if you are not too careful. All right, you have the, the common ones such as E. coli, Salmonella, Listeria, Campi. All right, and these cause severe foodborne diseases and health problems. So in every agribusiness plan, we must speak about the hazard analysis and critical control points plan or protocol. So what does this entail for the burger party making operation? We should have trained personnel. We should have accurate and honest and transparent product description. We must have a clear operational process flow diagram for the entire business. We must outline different hazard analyses and critical control points. We must establish different critical limits and practice monitoring at each point. So what does the HACCP allow us to do? It's really for corrective action, for verification procedures, to update our standard operation, operating procedures manual and for record keeping. So these are some questions for you to discuss with me soon after the presentation. How difficult is it to produce burger parties with limited resources? How can you make a burger party that most or other competitors can't replicate? How can you add the burger party making process to a livestock operation? Take one minute to note all of these questions. Thank you for all your attention. We are at the end of the presentation segment and now entering the discussion segment for tonight. All right, so let me go through the comments here and let's see what's up. Okay, so a comment or a question from Cohen. Do have to pay more attention to fat ratio since we culturally like our meat well done. Well done and lean, correct? Whereas the other cultures may not fully cook their burgers other and other meats. That's true. So culturally, we in the CARICOM or Caribbean like our meats very lean and low in fat. But with, with value-added products such as patties or sausage, we have to take into consideration the fat, fat meat percentage. Yeah, because I, I realize even um, in your average, let's say grocery or your, your average burger cart, um, what we really see is the diner style burgers. Right. Right. And, um, and I think, again, probably because of the way we, we like to, to consume our meat, among other factors. Yeah. Um, could be one of the reasons why that one is so much more popular here. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's exactly it. Right. And remember, the, the, the diner style parties are cheaper, it's smaller, it's easy, easier to manage and replicate. Yeah. Risha is asking, what are good meat mixtures to put into a burger? So, Rish, if I had to suggest, of 100% meat, I would come up with a 60 to 70% beef patty and use the other 30 to 40% with one other type of meat to give it a, a different flavor. I don't really want to add two, well, more than two meats to one burger patty type. 
because the flu the flavors might be some might be overwhelmed or not in enough concentration to give you that flavor effect. All right, so a 70 to 30 ratio of beef to any other type will work. If you want a nice gamey, a gamey type flavor or, or a game bird, you could add actually duck, all right? That has a nice fat percentage that goes well. If you want to add a nice a seafood flavor, I suggest you go with tuna or salmon rather than shrimp. So when Trini seasoning is green seasoning, not salt and pepper alone, correct? Right? Now the traditional burger, salt and pepper. You see when people make the burgers, they just use salt and pepper, not anything extra. We have a culture here where we dress our own food after. You know, we put excess salt, and you put your mayo, put your honey mustard, put your ketchup, you know, put your pepper sauce. So these are things we could also do on the inside of operations to even lower the cost of operation where when we serve our products it's all it, it's almost complete you know any customer doesn't have to do much with it after yeah one of the things i notice uh even you know when we would look at different food programs and stuff yeah uh they season their meat very little because they want to get more so the flavor from the meat, meat itself. Rather than the seasoning. Right. You know, so I think this now would lend um, to some of the, the questions that we have at the end, because even considering your target market is important and understanding what it is they are looking for. Yeah. Right? So, you know, in other words, you know who you're creating your product for. Correct. And with the, with the extensiveness of seasonings, I don't think we have a shortage of combinations of seasonings to use. Because as Caribbean people, we like well-seasoned and well-cooked yeah. food. Yeah? So, Joshua is saying, can't you add a green seasoning, etc., three tavern style patties? Definitely. All right, so salt and pepper is just the base. Now, every patty maker will be will have a different combination. They will use a different combination of seasonings, different size or styles of seasonings, even different varieties of seasonings. And all of those will have a different effect on the final product. Um, Cohen is also saying quail burgers. Well, Cohen, I don't know two things <laughs> with the quail burger. I don't know how much meat you want to get from the quail to put in the burger. <laughs> it was the, the second thing is how much you gonna charge for a burger? 300 TT? <laughs> right? Yeah, they have people paying that man. I know no well what it will come to trend. I have to try it out. <laughs> yeah. You just had a um, you just had to find a nice niche market for that suit as well. No, no, people will buy it. Right? Yeah. And, and if, if you had to use um, egg as a binding agent, you're using your quail eggs in that too. One thing. Right? So you could even market it as a health product. And what I am helping a, a colleague in Jamaica do as well right now is to create these burgers, but at a naturally produced level. So forage fed livestock alone and forage fed birds. Right. So when we mix both, we do use the eggs as a bind. And we do use, well, corn. We, we grate some corn as well for the stickiness and sweet potato to, to use as binder. So that whole patty, whole burger, is 100% locally made. And right. all those things you could get right on the, you could grow right on the farm and all too. Yes, yeah, a thousand acre farm. So we have everything there. Right, so Joshua is saying he definitely is hungry, so I'm glad I, I took you to that point. So, um, Khadija is asking how to add fat to a fish burger if you are not using salmon or tuna. So, that's a bit hard to do, Khadija, because usually a base product is a meat, and you should choose a meat with enough fat in it. Now, if you have to choose a fish, um, you have to source a variety or a breed of fish that has a little more fat in it if you're not using salmon or tuna. So you have to get another alternative. All right. 
The thing with using with making fish burgers, it doesn't hold very well when they, when they make it into that composite form, as well as obviously fat percent is very low. All right. And if you if you try to over season that fish sometime, you may tend to get a bit of a salt fish type burger flavor. So you have to know which fish you're using and how you want to incorporate those seasonings into the burger. Because you don't want somebody to tell you about saltfish burger. Right? You want to market it as a seafood burger with different well, fish flavor or shrimp or tuna or salmon. All right. So I think I answered all the questions there. Cool. And if you want, we could go to, to my questions and let the class um, give us a chat on it. Yeah, Riada. Sorry. Um, I had some noise in my background there. Hold on. Right. So, how difficult is it to produce burger patties with limited resources? Think, and before anyone answers, think about the four questions I asked very early on in this slide. How much forage is needed? How much livestock is needed? How much feed is needed? How much space, labor, housing and environment, treatment, veterinary care, water, electricity is needed? How, what is the cost of slaughtering? How much meat do you get after to get that pound of beef for to make that burger party? Think about that whole process before you answer the question. Go and just repeat the question once more. How difficult is it to produce burger patties with limited resources? Anyone could answer. Well, for those who would have also been on last week's session, this, this is a nice comparison. Because you realize the input for the burger, as opposed to the input to the um, sausage. sausage making, is 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 very different. Good. So your starting cost is higher because you're only using high quality meat. So, if no one would answer just yet, let me give you some uh, idea. The easiest thing to do to to continuously make high profit is to specialize. And this is something you would have learned in POB many years ago. Now, do not try to do the entire process of livestock production and burger party making. It's almost impossible unless you have a commercial size operations and you could afford all the facilities to run simultaneously. What you have to do is buy the end products from the butchers or the master butchers at the market. So they don't need to know what your final product will be. They just know they're selling beef $20 a pound. Right. So you go and ask them for the beef chuck, which is very well marbled, almost perfect for burger party making. And that's your, that's your cheap start. Right? That's a very cheap start. And what you could also do later down is to even get cheaper meat substitutes like, um, like chicken, and you can mix the different type of meats, 60% beef, 40% chicken, to even lower your cost. And by the time you put egg as a binder, in, in some cases, if you need, most likely you may not need. Um, that's also very cheap as well. Eggs are generally cheap in Trinidad and Tobago. So yes, that's a lot of ways you could carry down your cost of production only when you know the entire process of what exists. Yeah. <clears throat> I think this is um this was a, a, a really nice comparison because we would have seen in sausage making it is much easier to um combine the sausage making with the actual livestock production process. Right. Right. But with the burger patty, um it is best to just stick to that side of it alone. Right. So it is easy to go out the road and pay six to ten dollars for a sausage, fully loaded sausage sandwich, as opposed to paying forty to fifty dollars for a burger patty, hamburger. Yeah. Right? You, you, you know, understand now why the cost is so much different. Right. Yeah. So if you go ahead with question two, no going. 
how can you make a burger patty that most can't replicate? Right. Any of the masterminds or any of the new students can answer this. Okay, so right away I'm thinking um, locally sourced. Okay, before I go, go ahead in that direction, um, I'm thinking more of like the neotropicals, like either Guti or Iguana, um, because it's, it's unique to this region. Right. Um, you know, as well as our seasonings, um, when you say when you say it's unique, um, or not like any other burger, you're talking worldwide or locally? Local, or just just local. I got you. Okay, so yeah. we could mix meats. Um, let me, let me help you refine as you go along now. So when yeah. you say new tropical animals, mm -hmm. let us choose two new tropical animals or three that could work to make new tropical burgers. Yeah. Right? So the Muscovy duck is a poultry, type of poultry, and it's a local duck. And yeah. it has a nice fat percentage as well in it. Right? Yeah. It's a bit of a lean meat as well, but it holds very gamey and good flavor. That's one. Yeah. The second thing is, we wouldn't use Iguana because we might get locked up because of the new rules and laws. Oh, okay. We wouldn't use a Guti so much because of the dressing percentage of a Guti. However, we could use something called lap or capybara. Capybara is the largest rodent in the world. We're 150 or 60 pounds. Right. You could get a lot of meat from that. So by just using the capybara and the muscovy duck, those are, those are the ones you should narrow down to make your, your neotropical burger patty. Yeah? Okay, yeah. yeah. You know, um, something else came to mind, you know, with Burger King releasing this whole impossible whopper, which is made... Um, it's actually plant based, but yeah. it's, it, I've tasted it and it tastes pretty similar to beef. Um, so that's, I mean, it's out of the box, but it is something that is being done as well. Yeah, good. So, in the we have one or two vegan sessions in 20, vegan and vegetarian sessions in 2021. I will try to incorporate it into those as well. Yeah, right, sure. Cool. And if you want, you could just do the third question. How can you add the burger patty making process to a livestock operation? Anyone could answer that, including you, Cohen. <laughs> um, so if I, ah, Josh, all right, Josh, I, I, I catch it. <laughs> I was saying, if you already have a um, a well established, you know, meat production operation, be it poultry or red meat, as the case may be, um, essentially you could buy the equipment that are, you know, useful and recommended for producing patties at a large scale. Um, yeah. You could use your network in terms of like the restaurants and stuff that you supply to, and you can sort out contracts and whatnot um, so that you could produce the parties for them if they would like. It could save them the labor and the costs. Great. That's a good idea. But where do you think you'll get all your raw materials from? You could get it. I mean, that's, that's what I said. If you have um, an up and running successful meat operation, you could probably get it from the farm. Good. What I want to suggest, Josh, is let another farmer handle that operation or to handle that burden. And you mm -hmm. just focus on his or her end product. Buy okay. it and then start your own. And let that person in your direct the cost of production to rear a bull for two years, feed, right. labor, um, grass, um, forages, veterinary okay. care, all the expenses. And you could come in 10 minutes and buy how much pounds of beef you want and yeah. go and fabricate and, and make your, your patties. Understand? Yeah. 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 So, that, so when it's specialized, you will actually streamline how you want to do things. And you will observe which farmers have a particular type of quality 
so that you could know how to make your parties. Okay, so in other words, you don't um, recommend adding it to like uh, a no. meat okay. No. Okay. Well, for small scale farmers, you shouldn't go through the whole process. Right. Because that's many businesses you have in one small chain. Yeah. All right? So what I want to suggest is just use the end products of the industry, of the livestock industry to start your new industry. Yeah. So what I was thinking, I mean, if what somebody wants to do is just go into the burger making, then yep. yes, right? Just go straight and buy a beef. But if you have, if you want to go into long-term livestock production, and right. let's this say, you know, you, you have a yeah. nice 10, 10, um, 10 plus year plan, yeah. then what I would do, I would brand the farm, right? So that when you're ready now to create value-added products, yep. the value-added products also we'll carry the, 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 that brand. So you're right. not really looking to just sell your um, sell your thing to, to other folks then, yeah. right? you funneling your best cuts into the branded product that you'd be making as well. But again, that is really for somebody with a large operation. Yeah. And that is not something that would start in two weeks or two months. No, no. But yeah. it should be, anytime you have a long-term plan like that, these operations, you have to fit in. In, in or at the end of those raw material production operations. That is yeah. the only way you will create more value for the raw material product. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, man, this was a very interesting session and a very interesting contrast to sausage to making. To the sausage making, yeah. I didn't want you all to think that it's similar because really not. <laughs> right. So, Khadija, if, if, if you will, if you want, you could just unmute, please. And um, let us know of, uh, about what you thought about the the presentation tonight and the questions. All right. Good night. Good night. <clears throat> I think it was interesting, and um, in terms of the ratio, um, the meat to fat ratio, I learned that. Um, with regards to the fish, what I wanted to know um, when I was asking if. Um, if I could use another fish um, and how I could add the fat. The fish that I, I had in mind was banan because of the texture of it. Right. Um, so now I'm thinking if I should probably try mixing the banan and the salmon together. Yes. Yeah. Because the salmon will have the fat in it. Yeah. And your original fish will have the body or the flavor. Yes. Right. So you could mix it 70, 30, 80, 20. Okay. Yeah, that's a good combo actually. And um, with regards to doing it um, for commercial use, yeah, um, you were talking about um, I can't remember right now, but um, in order to preserve it, okay, you so to preserve the burger patties, you could actually get, well, oh, you weren't you weren't any sausage making, so let me just go through. No, that I wasn't. Thing. Um, so when you mix all the meats. Right, you could either vacuum pack it in that shape after making it in the shape, vacuum pack it, put your label yeah. on it, and but on the label it must state it is uncooked, raw, or needs to be cooked because some people might open it and eat it. Right, so that okay. must be on the label is is a standard. And if you are cooking it, you could do the same thing. You just vacuum pack and put ready to eat. Okay. So the major thing is once you have the equipment to form, you do you, you actually have small equipment that could fit on your uh, table. And, and I was okay, so you, you showed us two equipments as well, too. Yeah. You know where it can be sourced? Yeah, it could be sourced locally, but yeah, well, when I say locally, one or two companies down here bring it, but they obviously bring it from, from away and it, it it's about two to four weeks sometimes you have to wait. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> What Actually, kind of price range are you looking at? Um, between ten to fifteen thousand for, for the more complex ones. Right. Right. So you realize the equipment for this is a bit more than the sausage making process too. Yeah, but then the end product selling for four or five a, times a, more a higher price as well. Yeah. 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 
So I'm glad you all get to see both sausage making and burger, burger party making so you understand the different parts of um, the value chain. Yeah, and all in all, um, we are still seeing that both of these operations can easily be started from home. Yeah, correct. As a small base operation and, you know, you scale and you, you, you move forward from there. Mm-hmm, correct. Yeah. Right? Because I also saw, I think that was what, was it the second machine? Where yeah. um, you had, it looked like different molds. So different you molds. They have the heart, different the circular, shape. different shapes, yeah. Right, so now I'm looking at that could be other ways that somebody could um customize could separate it. themselves from the pack. Not only yes. that, even up as opposed to just using these arbitrary shapes, you know, we could create shapes yes. um, that <clears throat> represent something on a cultural or a national level, yes. right? So Again, just some creativity, but this was also very encouraging to see. Yeah, there are so many opportunities um, that could be started on that home base level, right? That is not too cash intensive. Correct. Correct. And, and I really like the burger making process because I think the output for me, in my opinion, is a much better and healthier product. No excess binders or fillers, as, like the sausage making. Right. No offals, just some good solid meat, well yeah. seasoned. Yes. Yeah. So, so in my opinion, I would have choose a burger over a sausage. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we we do have a, a very strong burger culture mm -hmm. in Trinidad. Yeah. Correct. Right. Um. Because you know, is 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 all well and good for the the foreign franchises, but I, I believe I still prefer a roadside burger. Of course. Right? Well, and you could see it cooked right in front of you on the street yeah. side, under good condition, good clean condition. Yeah, it's part of the culture and experience. Yeah, so, you know, I, I could put in a little plug for my people in um, Best Burger, yeah, the Best Blessed Burger, <laughs> right? Um. <laughs> Because if, I mean, and all these are things to pay attention to, because remember initially, the, when the foreign franchises started coming in, it was very difficult for them yeah. to get a foot in, in the, um, the burger arena, yeah. right? But remember, we're dealing with people with a lot more resources financially and all these things. So eventually, um, they came in. So let me ask you a very... <clears throat> Interesting question here now. Would you say that we we have seen a decrease in our roadside burgers since that happened? No. Um, I think I have seen an increase and I can tell you why. We okay, the smart entrepreneurs of the last three or four years let the larger companies come in Trinidad and Tobago, take 10 to 15 years to build up the market for burger consumption, and then we slipped in smartly modified a few things, charge the same price for a burger, even less or even more, because people have the experience with what we could serve locally. Yeah. The experience is within 20 minutes for a burger to cook. You're not talking and laughing, watching some cars pass by. That experience midnight every night. Yeah. That's what people <laughs> pay for. That's what they pay for. Yeah, I like when you say that midnight. <laughs> That's well, really like us. I was young one, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, I, I am still intrigued with the um, with the tavern burger as well, because I, I, I could see it being done, not necessarily the roadside burger to start. Um, but yeah, I think I, I would like to, to probably um, if I had to choose, I might definitely want to experiment mm -hmm. with that one to right. see how we take it because one thing i know for sure it would be a very different look so it, it would get attention because when you're accustomed seeing um it's it like this more more bread than patty yeah and then you start seeing more burger than bread <laughs> yeah it's right? a different look yeah yes um you know again you just had a look at the whole 
cooking process and everything because you know we like our stuff well, well done. done. Um, so I'm wondering if you could probably pre-cook it, right? So yeah. that the actual time it has to spend on the um, uh, on the on, on the, the grill time. now yeah. is still that same. Let's say one minute both sides because you already do you, most you of could the work. Pre we could pre-cook just the whole form, right? Yeah. So, but yeah, man. So you see, folks, there is always so much different ways, so much opportunity opportunities. And it's really up to us and our creativity. Yep. Yeah. I'll probably call call mine a um, fat boy burger. Yeah, because it's fat. I'm thinking neotropical. Neotropical. Neotropical burger sounds like a brand name. Just all that, that's a good name because you see, Joshua will make more money than you could win. Because when people hear fat boy, they'll get excited. One time, but then they go say, wait, not I have too much weight. But when you see that new tropical burger come out, <laughs> but who know they go understand, wait, not this is a local thing. Yeah. New tropical, that's a new world. It's a modern burger. You understand? All right, Joshua, we battling. Ah, boy. <laughs> <laughs> new tropical. Yeah, man, bring it on. Um, Riyad, I wanted to yeah. ask. Uh-huh. You mentioned that there were some new rules about iguana and whatnot. Um, this is specifically with regard to hunting them? or Yeah, you can't hunt them. Okay. What about if they're raised? From I, I don't believe you remember from the Agoti presentation, you mm -hmm. got some information about getting a permit to even raise wildlife. Mm -hmm. And it was up to the game warden or the chief game warden to give that um, permit or not based on what he or, she, he or she sees. Yeah. Right, so I don't think you'll get the permit to, to, to ray gonna intensively. Oh, so nice. you, you definitely wouldn't be able to even slaughter out of the season if you got it, even if you got it. Yeah. So the inconsistency in supply would uh, uh, hamper up your production operations. Yeah, I can see that. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you. But, you know, that could be a plus as well, you know, um, uh, based on how you structure the operation. Because if you have something that is seasonal, seasonal then demand. you also could create um, yeah. more of a demand because you only have a short amount of time to get a particular product. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. Josh, you might have people lining up more than Japs. <laughs> yeah, true. And I was thinking to... Um, how um, KFC always has their kernels catch and they kind of brand it around Lent time and stuff. And, yeah. and, and, and then for Lent, they will have the fish parties. Right. And then yeah. for Diwali, they might have, you know, some veggie something, right. you know. So, so for, for season, you have to match your product with market yeah. and seasons. Yeah. I suppose maybe that's why um, Burger, Burger King brought out that impossible upper around now. I don't know how long it's been out, but maybe it was. I think out. it was out a little while, huh? Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, because they would be paying attention to the grain markets, right? Yeah. And the, um, just as we would have mentioned in, I can't remember which session it was, food innovation is a very big thing now. Yeah. And what is being done within the veggie, you know, vegan community, um, it, it, it really is remarkable. Right, mm -hmm. to give me something that looking, smelling, tasting like beef, and telling me there's a plant, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And you ain't using no no maggi beef seasoning or nothing <laughs> like that. Then yeah, that is that is real kudos. Yeah, good, right? So you see, that's our next plug for maggi there as well. I know probably we got a sponsor. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Well, Riyadh and company, this has been another very, um, very, very interesting session. We look forward to people really taking the, the information and moving forward with it. Because, yes, we see that a lot is going on nationally and globally, but there is also room for opportunity, right? So one of the the big hopes that we have from doing these sessions is that the people who may have already had 
ideas to get into food and agriculture in some way, form, or fashion that, you know, these courses or these sessions be the spark to help you see that, you know what, this is something that I can and should move forward with, right? Um, because there is room, <laughs> okay? So, folks, right. you all have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the rest of the weekend, right? And as we always say, let's get growing.